So hey there, welcome back to Accelerated Real Estate Investor. Hey, it's Josh Cantwell. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've got a special treat for you. Uh, for those of you that are looking for cash flow for income and to build a really truly massive business, um, I have a special interview today. Uh, my guest for today is an investor in mobile home parks for the last two decades. But guys, check this out. He is now the fifth largest owner of mobile home parks in the entire United States. He owns over 250 communities spread out over 25 states. Uh, it all started back in 1990s with one mobile home park in Glebenhaven, Texas. Um, he is partnered with a gentleman named Dave Reynolds, and they are a massive owner of mobile home parks. Uh, Frank has always believed in mobile home parks and about their affordable housing. And along the way, he has built an incredible business coupled with his partner, Dave Reynolds. It's involved into a course, it's involved into a boot camp, and they've become the leader in mobile home park investing and mobile home park training. He holds a, uh, a, a, a degree in economics from Stanford University. He is also active in community fairs, including the Lions Club, his school board, and is the chairman of the Landmarks Commission. In this interview, uh, Frank and I discuss, first of all, what he's working on this week, which is his quarterly reporting. He's got hundreds and hundreds of investors, and they produce a massive quarterly report uh, where they try to provide full transparency to all of their investors. We talk about that. Number two, we talk about owning businesses in niches where there's a moat, a moat around your business that protects the business, protects the industry from outside forces. Number three, we'll talk about Frank's first deal he ever did a mobile home park that he bought for $400,000 with $10,000 down and a seller carry. Uh, number four, we'll also talk about how the 2008 crash is what actually launched the mobile home park industry into its current status of becoming a much more institutionalized business. And finally, uh, number five, we'll talk about how you don't have to own 250 parks like Frank does in order to be successful you can have one to five parks to tr create true financial freedom. This is an absolutely fantastic interview with one of the largest real estate investors you're ever going to meet. His name is Frank Rolf. He's on Accelerated Real Estate Investor. Here we go. Welcome to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you're looking to retire early with forever passive income, you're in the right place. This podcast is the go-to destination for real estate investors, both active and passive, and multifamily apartment investors, both new, intermediate, and advanced. Now, sit back, listen, learn, and accelerate your business, your life, and your investing with the Accelerated Investor Podcast. Hey, Frank, listen, so excited to have you on the show today on Accelerated Real Estate Investor. Thanks for carving out some time for us. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Josh. Hey, thanks for jumping on. Hey, listen, Frank, I know mobile homes is your thing. You're super successful at it, one of the largest owners in the country. But I'm always excited to hear what our guests have that's going on right now, like today. What are you working on that you're excited about? A new park, a new event? What's something in your world that you're really passionate for that you're working on, you know, this afternoon or, or next week? Sure, Josh. Yeah, th th this week, in fact, this weekend is dedicated to our quarterly reports because we're, we're a large operator of parks and we do a quarterly report. So Q1 is due out on Monday. Nice. So we're focusing all our attention on getting that ready. Well, well, tell me a little bit about what's going to be in the report. Help me understand. You're probably reporting to investors. You've probably got institutional investors, Correct. mom and pop yeah, investors. We're, we're, we're uh, sure. We, we, we report on our uh, net occupancy. Uh, we've we've gone up in net occupancy. We have gone every quarter since the pandemic hit. Uh, we talk a little bit about collections, the struggles with the CDC declaration on evictions, uh, but we're fair, faring pretty well on that as well. Uh, this one, we focus on property condition. We send the investors a video of every property every other quarter. This quarter is one of the video quarters. So we select one of those and show them how that's going. So it's basically just gives everyone a snapshot of how, what's going on right now with the properties. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, you probably have a lot of people that, of course, are looking forward to those updates. You guys have 250 sure. communities, 25 different states. Um, 
as that's grown, because you know we own about 3,500 units of apartments and multifamily, we put out a quarterly report as well. What have you learned about distributing those reports over the years? And what do you think your investors are looking forward to? The word I hear and I, I believe in most is transparency. But what are some of the things as your reports evolved over time? What do you think the investors look forward to hearing from the most? Or what do you think they like to read the most? Well, you know, there's there's an old adage in advertising, Josh, the people who are really interested in something will read any number of words, right? That's why Rolls Royce started out 1,000 word ads back in the 60s. So we try to give our investors every bit of data to the extreme. And those who are interested can read through everything they want, watch the videos of the properties. We even include paragraphs by the managers of what they're working on. Uh, some people just gloss through it, read the overall macro. We give people a macro start on the front. So they, it's a short form. They don't have to read the whole thing. But then we have others who probably peruse every inch of it. I, I agree with you. I think transparency is key. And uh, we try to give people uh, an unlimited amount of transparency. Got it. Love it. So, Frank, let's back up a little bit now that we know what you're up to, what you're kind of working on this week, next week in your team. Your strategy is mobile home parks. You're one of the largest operators in the country top five in the entire country with ownership, 250 parks. Tell us a little bit about, I guess, I guess talk to our audience a little bit. Why mobile home parks and how do you invest in mobile home parks? And talk a little bit about your money-making strategy, your system for doing that. But let's talk with the first question. Why mobile home parks? Because a guy that can build as big a business as you have probably could have been successful with self-storage or, or multifamily or apartments. Why mobile homes? Okay. M- mobile home parks, if, if you're a big fan of Warren Buffett, as I am, uh, Warren Buffett always talks about having a moat. And mobile home parks have perhaps the biggest moat in American industry because they have not allowed any to be, any to be built since the 70s. Mm-hmm. So each year in the U.S. there's roughly 10 built. There's about 100 torn down. So we're actually an endangered species. And so that one, just that one fact gives them value, the ability to push rents, favorable supply-demand positioning, so that's the big one. Mm-hmm. The other one, going back to the mode is your customers cannot move their homes because it costs about $5,000 to move a mobile home, and you're not even legally allowed to move them if they're older than 1976. So mm. what happens is it's a customer base that is very, very sticky. The average tenancy is roughly 14 years. So between the fact parks and the homes really don't ever move, uh, that we feel gives us an edge as far as the stability and making income. Love it. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I had a great conversation with one of my old business partners last week. We sat down for breakfast and we started talking about the storage container business and Mm -hmm. how storage containers, people taking old storage containers, which you can buy for a couple thousand dollars, three to five thousand dollars. Now there's this whole new niche springing up of storage containers, which have a 50 year lifespan potentially being renovated, you know, dropping in electrical plumbing. How do you see that niche, or do you, are you paying attention to that at all? And is that something yeah, that might that, be the future of potential mobile homes? Well, Josh, the problem is in, in the United States, to put a mobile home in a mobile home park, it has to have a HUD seal on it. Mm. And HUD has never made a HUD seal for storage container homes. So those fall under the definition of the tiny home, which you could put on your own property out somewhere, but you're not allowed to put it in a mobile home park. So it has to have that defined HUD seal. So if someone took tiny, uh, took uh, storage containers, built a factory, and ran the engineering through HUD, and HUD had someone who supervised the factory, then I could put them in parks, but I can't. Mm. And actually, you know, storage containers were studied by Tony Sai, the Zappos founder who died recently tragically yeah. in a fire. Uh, he, he, his office gave us a tour of his mobile home park that he actually lived in until his death, uh, which is called Airstream Village in Las Vegas. And before he made Airstream Village, which was all about airstreams, mobile homes, and tiny homes, uh, he tried to make it out of storage containers. And he found Mm. there were limitations on storage containers geographically because in Las Vegas, uh, the storage container coupled with the heat was was too expensive to cool. Oh, interesting. uh, Interesting. I I do believe, though, I mean, I I know exactly what you're talking about. I think there's a big future in housing for radical designs like that. But I think they're cool as can be. I just, I can't put them in a park. Yeah, Frank, what are your thoughts now on we have a massive affordability issue? And a lot of people are talking about mobile home parks as a solution for that, but a lot of mobile home parks are not being built. You said the ratio of uh, tear-ups to tear-downs or build-ups to tear-downs is 10 to 1 in the reverse direction. But we have this affordability issue where even your average home value, now you're hearing various ranges, is near $300,000. 
back when I got started right. investing 15 years ago, it was more like 160,000 and values just mm -hmm. keep going up. Supply is down at an all time low. How do you see mobile home parks solving some of that issue? And what do you see the issue with uh, affordability on your end? Well, mobile home parks are, are hated by city government. And so <laughs> you're not going to see them issuing any more permits going forward. They don't find them to be an asset to the community. Uh, they don't really like the residents. So you're never going to really change that. And I okay. know that people have talked about it, but the only areas you can build mobile home parks today would be areas that no one wants to live. So blighted parts of town, uh, county areas so far away from employment, no one would want to drive there. It's a, it's a real problem. So really mobile home parks won't, won't be the solution to affordable housing. Uh, there's about 20% roughly of vacancy in the existing subset of parks out there. So once that's exhausted, then that's about all the mobile home parks can, can contribute. That's about it. Got it. Got it. Understood. Which, you know, when, when you have the moat that you're talking about, which is not only a current moat, but a future moat uh, of not a, the ability to build a lot more, but a long desire, 14 year occupancy. So let's talk about the way we make money with mobile home parks. So step us through an average deal. Sure. Step one. I know we've only got about 20, 30 minutes, so we can't go through the whole system. Yeah. I know you teach this through your seminars and books and courses. Yeah. But give us, give us the high level. What's the step-by-step -step process to acquire a park, stabilize a park, own a park, and some of the returns that we can expect? Sure. All right, let's start with uh, what you have to watch out for when you're buying them. We break down any purchase into five segments. Uh, the infrastructure, which means the water, the sewer, the roads, the electricity, uh, the, the, the very makings of what makes it a mobile home park. Uh, and and there's certain things you want and, and certain things you don't want. For example, you can't get a loan on a dirt road park. You can't get a, a loan on a park that's got a lagoon. So there's certain things the lenders will not stand behind. So that kind of excludes those things. Then we look at density. That's how many units you have per acre. Because at a certain density, the lots are so small, you can't put new homes on them. And the fire marshal may shut you down. Then you got the economics of the deal. Obviously, that's, that's the big one. Mm -hmm. The age of the homes. We try and stay away from parks where the homes are predominantly 1960s and 70s because those are becoming obsolete because of their floor plan. And then the location, obviously. If you put it all together, it spells ideal is what, is what it is. But that's, those are the five things we look at buying. I'll give you an example of a park we recently uh, sold, which is a good case study. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, I can tell you the price on both directions because yeah, there's please, no that's great. on it because it was in the, it was in the newspaper. Uh, we bought a mobile home park in Austin called North Lamar. Uh, we paid about $2 million for it. 68 lots, about 66 occupied. The lot rent was three ninety a month, including the water sewer. Fast forward about six, seven years, we raised the rent to 585. We made them pay their own water sewer and we sold it to the residents for about $5.2 million. Mm. So how did we make the money in the deal? Well, if you broke it down into pieces, obviously the bulk of the money was made in raising the rent. And that's, that's what is attractive about the industry is our rents are so crazy stupid low. The average US lot rent for mobile home park is running about 280 a month, which is about a thousand with less than apartments. So we, we feel, we, we modeled the industry as being in the future, rents being in the fives and 600s, which to us is far more reasonable, still not even pushing the envelope. But pushing rents is by far the biggest money maker. If you could buy any par any park that you could finance, just buy the park, as long as it'll cover the mortgage, that you can push the rents up, let's say $30 once a year, let's say it's an 80 space park, in three years you made a million bucks. It's that, it's that simple, it's all about raising rents. Are you ready to automate and explode your real estate investing? We're searching for extremely motivated individuals who are sick and tired of wasting time and want to finally see real results from their real estate investing business. We're searching for investors looking to get to the next level and become a bigger, better version of themselves while being a more successful real estate investing entrepreneur. Apply for mentoring and coaching at joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. That's joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. Got it. And is your strategy, Frank, you got all these different communities. I'm sure they're not all exactly the same. I've looked at mobile home parks, full transparency. I don't own one yet. Our focus has been on multifamily apartments, but we are looking and learning more about mobile home parks. Um, the cash flow is amazing. Uh, the financing is you know obviously not as high loan to value as some of the other asset classes, um, but is your strategy primarily to just buy the park, lease out the lot, 
Or are you also doing things where just renting some of the units or doing rent-to-owns on some of the units? You see some parks that are a mix of maybe three different types of income from lot rent to full rent-to-own on a unit or full leasing of a unit. And I understand the financing is different depending on the percentage of those three components. But what is in your mind, because you're the expert, what's the ideal structure? Is it all just lot rents or is there a mix of those three? Yeah, our, our, like any other real estate sector, we're, we're, we're governed by lenders and what lenders like to see. Uh, lenders don't want you to own any homes. So we try and be strictly in the land renting business. We, we view our business as a parking uh, industry. Yeah. And uh, like parking a car, you park your trailer on our, on our parking lot and you pay us the parking lot rent. Now, to fill our vacant lots, we have to bring in the homes because there's no mechanism out there for mobile home park residents to be able to get a loan on a mobile home unless we're in the loop. So we have to do that. But then the goal is for them to buy the home. Then we're no longer in the loop and just rent the land. But yeah, definitely the goal is not, not to be in the home rental business, just the land rental business. And do you, Frank, you structure your business in such a way that you buy the park with one entity and then buy your homes that are that, where there's vacant lots and then you have to work out a deal with the resident, buy those in a separate entity? So you're, you're truly just doing a lot rents with the That's financeable correct. piece of it with the lender. Yes, you'll find even the largest operators like uh, Sam Zell's ELS or mm-hmm. Sun Communities, the largest streets, they also have an, a home division because we try and keep our, our land business pure, simply as land rental. And then the home business, of course, ultimately goes away. So once your park is full, the home business dwindles to nothing. Got it. Love it. Now, Frank, what did you comment on? You've been in the business for a long time. You've seen the evolution. Help our audience understand what was the mobile home business like years ago? Uh, very sure. mom and pop, very fractured, not a lot of institutional financing, a lot of seller carry back type of stuff. Buffett gets involved, you know, lots of other guys kind of um, institutionalize the sector, if you will, and, and really scale the sector, find that there's lots of capital to be made in the sector. It becomes not so much of a mom and pop business anymore, although it's still a lot of, lots of mom and pop, but there's guys like you that are really institutionalized the business. A lot of new financing, a lot of new tools and resources have come along. Just give us some picture of the evolution of the business over the last uh, 20 to 30 to 40 years since you've been involved. And why is now, as you work with your members and students, why is now a great time to get involved? Okay. Well, I got in the business in the mid-90s, as did my partner Dave, uh, as did Sam Zell. We all started about the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, My partner and I, we, we have focused on the affordable housing side. That is the lower income portion of it. There's another part of it called lifestyle choice, which are mm-hmm. typically seniors in what look like Dell Webb communities. Uh, Zell was the pioneer of that Dell Webb community style of mobile home park, raised a lot of capital, uh, convinced lenders it was safe to make loans. And so he pushed the industry hugely forward starting in the 90s, but he never focused on the meat and potatoes, which is the affordable side. He only did the upper end. Okay. So what you have now is you have huge consolidation of the upper end. You've got ELS, Sun, RHP, and then a whole lot of private REITs buying up those glamour parks in California and Florida, but there's no one who's really consolidating the, the main portion. So of the, if you take the top 100 owners in the U.S. and you add up how many parks those top 100 own, they only own about 4,000, and there's 44,000 in the U.S. Wow. So we are the least consolidated form of real estate. But I, I mean, obviously that will change. Uh, there's, a, there's a large operator, the one, that's one, one notch ahead of us called Yes Communities, which is owned by the country of Singapore, GIC. Wow. And, uh, you know, they are rumored, there's been rumors for years now that they're going to go public and they'll be the first public read on the affordable housing side. Wow. And I think that will be the trigger for more investment banks and more banks to become intrigued by the industry. But that's what it needs. That's that's the problem right now. It's kind of like, it's like classic cars. You've got, you know, let's assume just, just Ferraris were collectible. Yeah. But that's not the bulk of all classic cars. It's the same issue. So, yeah, we, we don't have the consolidation yet. Understood. So, Frank, let's back up for a minute and talk about how you got started. You mentioned you got started in the 90s. You started with basically zero, bought your first park. Now you've got 250. It's a tremendous amount of growth over the last 20 or 30 years. What was the, I guess, the, the, the attraction for you to get into mobile home parks and what was it like in the early years, the first deal, the first couple sure. of deals? What were some challenges that you faced getting going? Sure. Well, let me go back up a step. So, so I started off in the billboard business. I did that for 14 years. Billboards, nice. College. 
Billboards, yeah. So I was I was the largest private owner of billboards in Dallas Fort Worth. I sold that to a public company in 1996, and then I needed something new to do. So I had built two billboards on a skanky mobile home park on the wrong side of town in Dallas. <laughs> skanky, I haven't and heard that word in a while. <laughs> I went to the guy. I mean, it was an absolute dump. And I went to the guy just talking to people to learn about their businesses. I might have become a McDonald's franchisee. I might have done this. Who knows what? But I called the guy up and asked him how that mobile home park makes money or how does it work? And the guy said, why don't you find out for yourself? I'll sell it to you right now for $400,000. Give me 10000 down. And I'll carry 390000 for 30 years. Wow. That's how I got in the business. It was that completely random. I only knew one thing when I made that call to the guy. And that was the zoning was very rare because in the billboard business, you can only build on certain zonings. And I knew I'd rarely see MH zoning. So I bought it just because I knew it was rare. I thought the worst I could do is lose 10,000 bucks. It was a non-recourse loan. And that's what got me in the saddle on it. And I learned from the adventure on that park that, A, I would never buy a park like that again. Okay. <laughs> so that park opened my eyes to what you need to buy and not buy. But that got me into the business and I've been in it ever since. I love it. I love the fact that you just jumped into it not knowing because that's a lot of what's happened with me over time is getting into real estate, did my first couple of deals, not knowing. Got into the fund management business, stood up my own fund, not knowing. There's no playbook for that. Um, there, right. you know, got into the multifamily business. Now, there's lots of gurus and playbooks for multifamily apartments, but I never went through one. I just jumped in, bought a park with a friend on a joint venture opportunity. Now we've raised $80 million and own 3,500 units. Never been through like right. a guru type of course. The action, the sure. education is important, but action so much more important. So now you work with hundreds of students. You've coached lots of different people. You have your own university. What are some of the things that you work with your members and students to get them going? When you're educating and talking with new people, what are some of the things? Because fear, just getting going, starting, uh, these are all yeah. things that people face, no matter what business they're starting. But what are some of the things that you're sure. working on with them mentally to get in the game? Well, I mean, the, the key is, you know, it's the old quote, think like a man of action, act like a man of thought. You know, you got to have both action and thought. Love that. And when I got into the business, it was all action, no thought, right? I bought this park. I did no due diligence. I didn't even do a survey. It's amazing. I didn't get just you didn't destroyed. Get clobbered. No environmental Jeez. assessment. Yeah. yeah. So you can't action without thought, no value. And then thought without action, equally no value. I see people all the time who get so into, uh, you know, the, the fear factor of the unknown that they overthink deals rather than realizing that there's baby steps they can do to get in there and analyze them. You know, one of, one of the big things we've tried to do with the industry, and again, we only teach it as a hobby. I mean, our day yeah. job is running the fifth largest operation. But, you know, there is a science to our industry. And, you know, it's evolved over the decades. But you, there's not a thing that goes on in a mobile home park that is not, there's not a scientifically correct, correct either this is smart or this is stupid. Got it. And, uh, you know, so, so we try and teach the science. And then we also really focus heavily on due diligence. You know, that's a reason for our success is, you know, along the way, we could have had some terrible deal that derailed us, caused investors to lose confidence, caused us to lose confidence in ourselves. But we avoided that because we learned the importance of diligence. I mean, Benjamin Franklin said that diligence is a mother of good luck. Mm. And so that's, that's a correct way to look at it. So we're very, very much about applying science to everything, which mitigates your risk. And then that gives you the comfort level to proceed. Yeah, so, you love know, it. You feel like you, when you feel like you understand the risks and you're, uh, and you're comfortable with them, then you can pull the trigger and buy the thing. In my newest real estate investing book, The Flip System, you'll learn the proven secrets and strategies that I've used to be a successful real estate investor. You'll also hear the story of my journey from quitting my job to doing over 2,000 units of apartments. The Flip System is now available for a limited time, and you can grab your free copy at getflipsystem.com slash podcast. You'll learn the same proven principles and secrets and investing strategies that I used to quit my job and pursue a life of financial freedom. In this book, I'm sharing exactly how I was able to personally close over 750 profitable real estate deals, make over 400 private lender loans, raise over $30 million, and acquire over 2,000 units of cash flowing apartments. Get my newest book now for free at getflipsystem.com slash podcast. That's 
getflipsystem.com slash podcast. By the way, guys, I know that you guys are probably loving this interview. Uh, uh, Frank's website is mobilehomeuniversity.com. Go check it out. There you can learn a lot more about his information and just getting started, their portfolio, their trainings, and all these kind of things that they do. Frank, I'm, I'm curious to hear, now that you've had all this success, you've coached thousands of people, you've raised lots of money, you're a massive operator, what are some things that you would tell your younger, former self you, you obviously got started by selling this other business, had some things to work with. You've got other students, members that start with nothing but have had success. What kind of advice would you pass along to yourself and to them, uh, things you've learned along the way that you think are important? Yeah, well, you know, Josh, first off, I got in the business really at the wrong time. I mean, a lot of people think that the 90s was the time to be in it. They really wasn't. If you got it in the 90s, you, you faced a couple terrible hurdles. One was the financing situation. Sure. Uh, banks hated making mobile home park loans in the 90s. If it wasn't sell or carry, you had to hit 100 banks uh, to even have a prayer of getting a loan. And many times we'd go all the way down to closing. They yanked a rug out from under us the day before closing. Mm. So financing was tough back then. The other problem was the industry faced a horrible crisis in 1999 called the Great Chattel Collapse, where all of the debt and all of these mobile homes collapsed because they had started doing mobile home zero down, no income doc loans. You probably heard of those in the 2007 sure. single family. Well, the mobile home industry had them in 1998, uh, and it was a catastrophe. It, ca it came out of a mortgage company that just thought that it was a smart thing to do, giving credit to people who aren't credit worthy with zero down. doesn't work. So uh, I might have told myself back in 96, hold off four years, to yeah. be honest with you. Uh, time to get the business started. The, the really best time for the industry began with the, the 2008 Great Recession. That's when it really worked well interesting because How come? suddenly mobile home parks had demand we had access to debt we were we started to gain respectability uh, apartment rents went way up of course we, we are competition in apartments so we could raise our rents in line with the apartments uh so first thing first message to myself 1996 don't buy anything for four years oh. learn about <laughs> the business do something else for four years all right uh, another one which i did understand then and i still tell, tell people today it's all about your quality of life Right. So if someone watching this saying, oh, I aspire to own 250, I wouldn't suggest that for anybody. I mean, it, it's been OK for me because I'm a workaholic uh, person. But, you know, for many people, owning one park or two parks or five parks is just dandy mm -hmm. because it all comes down to how is your life going? And, you know, so, some people, there are other things they want to do in life other than own mobile home parks. Uh, you know, the average owner spends four hours a week on them. So if you want to basically... Uh, replace your day job and spend four hours or so a week on something, then this is a good alternative. But, you know, it's not something where you, it's not like a bag of Lay's potato chips. It's okay to just eat one. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know, it worked out for me, but I work seven days a week, probably 10 hours a day, and I'm not going to recommend, I feel kind of like the golfer in uh, the Bill Murray Christmas movie that <laughs> comes back from the dad. I mean, it's not, it's not really essential that you grow to be gigantic. And yeah. Although it, it, it's, it's fun, it's fun at a cocktail party. It's really not that important. The big thing about park ownership that I really enjoy is it's a win-win business. You buy these old properties and you bring them back to life. Mom and pop is happy that you bought it. The tenants are happy that you fix it. Even though you raise the rent, they're happy because now they have good quality of life. And then meanwhile, in owning them, you're master of your own universe. You're master of your own time. You know, my greatest accomplishment was I was went to my daughter's every one of her sporting games and school events. That's a big deal to me. Yeah, I could not have done that in a corporate job. So uh, again, I think I think I, I like the win-win nature of the business in in all aspects, even in the giant macro of quality of life. And uh, so I would definitely tell myself to get back in it. I just might have waited a few years. Oh, great stuff, Frank. That's great advice, uh, especially the part, man. Pulling on my heartstrings with being at your daughter's events. As a matter of fact, as soon as we're done with this, I'm getting in the car. We're driving five and a half hours to Indianapolis. Because I coach club volleyball. My audience knows how sure. much I love club my, my, volleyball. My, my daughter was in club volleyball also. Oh, so what a great sport. Every weekend in the stands. Oh, heck yeah. And I'm, I coach, but this is probably the last year that I'll coach because they're getting a little too old and too good for, for dad to be right. the coach. You know, the high school coaches, the college coaches. Yep. And But I'll never miss them because of our, in your case, mobile homes. In my case, you know, uh, multifamily apartments. Regardless of what the niche is, that quality of life, that freedom of time is the most important thing. So, Frank, let's finish with the final five. Quick questions, sure. super fast answers. And, of course, guys, go check out mobilehomeuniversity.com, and we'll have Frank. He's got a, plenty of stuff. He's got his own podcast. He'll have to tell us about that at the end. Final five, Frank, 
Question number one, what's your favorite way to find deals, mobile home parks? Mobile home park brokers. Love it. Number two, what's your favorite way to find capital, cash, joint venture partners to get them funded? Reg D506 under the Jobs Act. Love it. Same thing that we use. Frank, what do you think has been the most impactful book or piece of advice or training that you've ever been through? Uh, the Man Who Bought the Waldorf, the story of Conrad Hilton by an author named Dabney. Oh, Greatest wow. book I've ever read. Great. Oh, my gosh. Never heard of that one. I'll have to check that out. Thanks for that. Uh, Frank, what's your favorite place to decompress and think? I know you just told us you work seven hours, sometimes 10 hours a day, but a guy that's done as much as you, you've got to have time to think through the next step. What's coming around the corner? What are the blind spots? What's your favorite place and way to think? Uh, what I do every night, uh, typically around midnight, I take out a pad of paper. I, wrote, I write uh, today with the date of the next day. I make a list of things I need to do and calls I need to make. And I think through, kind of like a, a ballet, what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. And that gives me the serenity of knowing what I'm doing the next day. And if I don't do that, if I don't fill that sheet out, I, I feel completely at a loss. Yeah. So I, th I just think through what happened today and what's going to happen tomorrow. I bet you sleep. For me, I do the same exact thing. I sleep pretty well at night knowing what my next day priorities are. Correct. Love yeah. it. Last question, Frank. Who's been maybe the best and biggest leader in your life, the mentor that you've had or person that's had the biggest impact on your life. And why do you think they've had such an impact? Uh, I'd have to say it's my partner, Dave Reynolds, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I thought I was pretty good at the business until I met Dave. Dave is by far the best I've ever seen. So I've just been fortunate to be kind of the Dwayne Wade to his LeBron James. <laughs> uh, Love it. From back in the Miami Heat days. Uh, you know, Dave, Dave is more of a workaholic than I am. He probably works an extra two to three hours more than I do each day, which I don't even know how it's physically possible. Except he's <laughs> younger than I am, so maybe he can live on less sleep. Yeah, I love it. Fantastic stuff, Frank. Listen, this has been a fantastic interview. I've had an absolute blast having you on. Thanks for joining me. I know you've got other information to share, a podcast, information, your trainings, your portfolio, your website. Where can people go to learn more about you? Well, obviously, they can go to the Mobile Home University site, which is also mhu.com. Uh, my podcast is called the Mobile Home Park Mastery Podcast. Uh, so those are probably the, the two best repositories of anything that I, I write or speak. Fantastic stuff, Frank. Listen, thank you so much for joining us today on Accelerated Real Estate Investor. Had a blast having you on the show. Thanks. Thanks a lot for being here, Josh. Well, there you have it, guys. Listen, one of the largest real estate investors you're ever going to see, ever going to meet, Frank Rolf. Uh, Frank is an absolute dynamite. You heard today how he works gosh, seven days a week, 10 hours a day. Uh, absolutely dedicated his life to the mobile home park business. And again, take Frank's advice. It's not something that you have to do to work that much. One to five parks can really set you free. If you loved this interview, which I hope you did, uh, please go subscribe right now. Go subscribe to Accelerated Real Estate Investor wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube. Go subscribe right now so you never miss another episode. Don't forget to check out Frank's website, mobilehomeuniversity.com. And also, if you enjoyed the episode, please, it would be my pleasure. I'd be so grateful. I'd be so thankful if you would leave us a rating and a review. Uh, let us know how we did. Also, if you could share this, you know, share this on your Facebook page, share this on your Instagram, share this all over social media. And finally, don't forget to jump into our free Facebook group. Go to Facebook, search Accelerated Real Estate Investor, and join our Facebook group for free. Thank you so much for being here today, and we'll talk to you next time. Take care. Hey, Josh here. And do you want to win a free Accelerated Investor t-shirt? All you have to do is give Accelerated Investor, our podcast, Accelerated Investor, a rating and a review on iTunes. Okay? Do that now. Then send us a screenshot on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. What we're going to do then is every week we're going to pick our favorite rating and review and we're going to send that person a free t-shirt and maybe, again, some other cool, fun stuff as well from Accelerated Investors. So, again, don't forget to take a screenshot. Leave a rating, review, take a screenshot, send it to us so we know exactly who you are. And then once a week, every week on the podcast, we will announce a new winner. Don't forget to take a screenshot and send it to us so we know exactly who you are. We'll announce a new winner every week.
You were just listening to the Accelerated Real Estate Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something new, help us build our community by leaving a review and five-star rating on our iTunes podcast channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. To see passive investing opportunities, visit freelandventures.com slash passive. To start your journey toward the lifestyle you've always dreamed of with multifamily apartments, apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching with Josh at joshcantwellcoaching.com.